Welcome back to our Year of the Bible. I'm Andrew Whaley. Today we will be exploring together the Gospel according to Luke. When I was in seminary, my New Testament professor David Bartlett told us that the Gospel of Luke was the Gospel of Presbyterians. Dr. Bartlett himself was a Baptist and claimed that the Gospel of John was the Gospel for Baptists because it talked so much about needing to believe in Jesus. The Gospel of Luke, though, he said, was for Presbyterians because it is an orderly account. It is done decently and in order. Also, this book is concerned about caring for the poor. It's very practical in the way that it's structured, and it focuses less on eternity in heaven and more on salvation as the forgiveness of sins, thus causing Dr. Bartlett to jokingly call it the Gospel of Presbyterians. The title of the book is somewhat confusing. There was no person named Luke that we know of who wrote this book. The author is never named. The, the book gets this attribution, though, because the author of Luke also writes the book of Acts. And several times in Acts, he uses the pronoun we when talking about missionary journeys with Paul. In reading Paul's letters, we hear that there's a beloved physician named Luke who is journeying with Paul. And so we've taken Paul's letters and the book of Acts and kind of put this together to assume this guy named Luke wrote the book. But there's nothing in Luke or Acts to say that the beloved physician named Luke wrote the book. Sometimes in Bible studies, there's language that says, well, because Luke was a physician, we don't know that. Maybe he was, but we have nothing in the text itself that tells us that Luke was a physician. Luke's gospel is written most likely sometime after 70 AD, after the fall of the second temple in Jerusalem during the Roman Empire. It's later than the Gospel of Mark, the oldest gospel we have, and the Gospel of Matthew. And so it comes towards the end of the first century. The first Christians are dying out, the ones who saw Jesus raised. And so Luke is interviewing them to put together an orderly account about the things that have happened with Jesus. Now, there are several things that distinguish Luke's gospel among the four gospels in our New Testament. First, Mark and Matthew are very much focused on the imminent return of Christ. There's this apocalyptic energy that the world is coming to a close and a new age is dawning. Luke, though, is written later, as I said. And so certainty about that second coming of Christ is waning somewhat. When he might return is a little more mysterious. It may not be quite so imminent. And so the way Luke writes his gospel is he says there was one era the era leading up to Jesus and his death and his resurrection. That is the end of one era and the beginning of another. But instead of it simply being the preparation for his coming again soon, there's a second era now of the church. So the age of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. Now it is the age of the church, which will last for an indefinite period of time before what we call the parousia, or the second coming of Christ, which is that third era. Mark and Matthew, the letters of Paul, mostly focus on two eras, the era leading up to Jesus' resurrection and then his coming again. Luke inserts this era of the church that will last for an indefinite number of years. It becomes a very important book then for us who are still here some 2,000 years after Jesus rose from the dead. Luke structures his gospel differently than the others as well. You know mostly about Luke because of the Christmas story. Luke has a long period of preparation leading up to Jesus' ministry. There's the prophecy to Zechariah about the birth of John the Baptist. Then we have the birth of Jesus. Then we have Jesus presented in the temple. Then Jesus grows up and is a 12-year-old boy in the temple. We have this genealogy in Luke that traces Jesus' heritage all the way back to Adam, the first human being. And then finally, after his temptation in the wilderness, Jesus comes to his home synagogue, opens the scroll of Isaiah, and says, Today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. That's the first four chapters of Luke. It's all preparation leading up to Jesus' ministry to help define who he is and what his mission will be. Chapters 5 through 9 then focus mostly on Jesus' teachings and his miracle work. And then the gospel turns. In chapter 9, verse 51, we read that Jesus turned his face toward Jerusalem. 
And so now we begin moving towards the cross. There's more conflict with the Jewish leaders of the time in this era. There's also time in these chapters where Jesus continues to do his teaching, but it takes on a more strident tone about what it means to be a true disciple of Jesus in the face of suffering and death. There are several themes also that are unique in Luke's gospel. They're present in the others, but Luke emphasizes them a bit more. For one, Luke talks a lot, has Jesus talking a lot about poverty and wealth. There are particular parables and stories unique to Luke's gospel that talk about this. You have the parable of Lazarus and the rich man, and Lazarus dies and goes into the bosom of Abraham, and the rich man dies and goes into eternal torment. There's another story of a different rich man, a parable Jesus tells, who has an amazing harvest and then builds bigger barns to store his his supplies in, and then he dies. There's the story of the short tax collector named Zacchaeus, who is also wealthy, who comes to Jesus and decides to give half of what he has away to the poor. And then there's this parable in Luke 14 of a great banquet where all the well-to-do people are too busy to come, and so the poor and the marginalized fill the tables. There is this contrast of poverty and wealth in the Gospel of Luke and how wealth and poverty come into the kingdom of God and how they're related and how wealth can be a hindrance to people living faithfully within the kingdom of God. There's also this description, as I mentioned earlier, of salvation coming in the form of the forgiveness of sins. It's less about where we spend eternity, more about the practice of forgiveness, the wiping away of wrongdoing. Those That theme comes to life in several distinct parables in Luke. The parable of the lost coin, the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost son. We even have Jesus in Luke, Luke alone, as he hangs on the cross saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. The theme of forgiveness runs throughout the Gospel of Luke. Another motif through all of Luke is this theme of food, meals, and hospitality. Jesus himself, when he's born in Bethlehem, is laid in a manger, a cattle feeding trough. So we see the bread of heaven laid in a trough, a feeding trough, from the very beginning of the gospel. We hear of Jesus being ridiculed for eating with sinners and with tax collectors. After his resurrection, we hear of Jesus eating and in the breaking of the bread with Cleopas and the other disciple on the way to Emmaus. When he gets to Emmaus, their eyes are opened in the meal. And then likewise, the disciples of Jesus come to recognize him after his resurrection when he eats with them on the beach. Pay attention to the way food and hospitality plays into the Gospel of Luke. Luke, more than any of the other Gospel writers, emphasizes the importance of women. That begins with the very birth of Jesus, where Mary, the mother of Jesus, is presented as the model disciple. Luke is also the only gospel writer to tell us the story of Mary and Martha hosting Jesus to eat. They're mentioned in John's gospel too, but in a different story. Mary and Martha are highlighted as women leaders. There's also a listing of women in the gospel of Luke, the names of the women who supported Jesus' ministry with their income. And then, of course, the women go to the tomb, as they do in all the Gospels, and they hear of the resurrection. But Luke alone says that when Mary Magdalene and the others go to Peter and the disciples, they dismiss what they're saying as an idle tale, an old wives' tale. Luke is pointing out that the wisdom of God in the resurrection comes first to the women, the ones who others dismiss. But Luke wants the church to see that the testimony of women must be listened to and honored. And lastly, Luke also writes Acts. So Luke's gospel is a prelude to the birth of the church. The gospel of Luke then is a model for those who follow in the way of Jesus to live their life together in that way. How we serve the poor, who we welcome at our tables. The earthly ministry of Jesus becomes the ministry of the church in the world. So enjoy the gospel of Luke, the Presbyterian gospel, and see how we might still learn what it means to be church through the words of this story of our Lord.